Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. So today I would like to introduce Dr. Hundle. Dr. Hundle attended medical school at Punjabi University in India. He then completed his residency at Erie County Medical Center in Buffalo, New York. He also completed an internship at SUNY Buffalo, also in New York, and his fellowship at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Dr. Hundle is board certified in ophthalmology. All right, without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hundle. The major issue we're going to talk about today is going to be cataract and diabetes. So let's start with the cataract. Uh, what we're going to talk about is basically definition of cataract. What is a cataract? And then what causes the cataracts? What are the symptoms? How do you know you have cataract? And then of course, what are the different kinds of cataracts? And finally, what is the treatment for cataract? And what are the possible complications and concerns from cataract surgery? It's basically a clouding of the lens of the eye. That's what a cataract is. Imagine somebody has a little smudge on their glasses, and you're looking through that smudge. This is how the early cataract feels like, that you're looking through a smudgy glasses. So in the early stage, the symptoms are fairly minimal, with mild, pretty mild blurred vision. In more advanced cases, you're going to see much more of a fuzzy vision or a blurred vision, almost like looking through a paint on your glasses or a dense opacity on your glasses. This is how an advanced cataract looks like. The normal pupil of the eye here, which is basically a black space in the iris, becomes totally whitish. That's how an advanced cataract looks like. That is the clouded lens of the eye, which is what a cataract is. If you look at the graphic description of the cataract, you look at the front of the eye here, this is the cornea here, this is a pupil, and this is the lens of the eye. Normally, it's crystal clear, but here it's more kind of whitish yellow. Uh, the light entering through this, through this clouded lens cannot reach the retina in a more clear, focused fashion, and that's why the image is blurred. And of course, as you can see in this blurred picture, that's how a moderate to advanced cataract patient looks like, uh, sees like. So what causes these cataracts? Basically, if we live long enough, we're going to get cataracts. It's an aging process in the lens of the eye that generally starts in the 60s and can occur at any age. You can also see cataracts in a younger patient or even you're born with cataracts occasionally in some situations. In terms of any particular reason, particular disease process, particular injuries or medications, Diabetes is one of the most common, uncontrolled, prolonged diabetes can cause cataracts. So does a lot of autoimmune diseases, some of the arthritis when they last long enough. And of course, any inflammation in the eye, uh, like chronic iritis or uveitis. And any prolonged use of steroids or prednisone, whether it's in the eye or it's in systemic or by mouth uh, long-term use. And any injury to the eye, whether it's blunt injury or it's penetrating injury, that can also damage the lens and cause cataract. Again, in this picture, the cataract is fairly advanced and looks complete white. And in this kind of situation, the vision is down to pretty much hand motion or light perception only. Now, the symptoms of cataract in the early stages is almost no symptoms at all. You don't know you have a cataract. It doesn't look any different. You don't feel any discomfort. But as the cataract forms more and more, you're going to start seeing blurred, or you're looking like you're looking through fog or clouds. And that's going to give you difficulty in terms of reading, watching television, driving at nighttime, 
and more glare at night time. Now this is about the way you see through a moderately dense cataract. This is the image that you see normally and this is where the blurred image is. So you're still seeing at the, at the object you're looking at, but it is not sharply focused. It's much more blurred and much more fogged up. At nighttime, of course, the lights are totally out of focus. Uh, that causes uh, difficulty in driving and seeing distant objects, and also you get much more glare at nighttime. Now, there are multiple different types of cataracts. This is more academic, but it may be of interest to you as a patient. The first kind of cataract is the so-called nuclear sclerosis type, the most common and commonly seen with the aging of the eye. This cataract can start early on in the 60s and continue through the 70s in many patients without bothering the patient in terms of the visual impact of this cataract. It's a pretty slow growing cataract and I've seen patients who have had cataract for 10, 15, 20 years, and they still see pretty good through the cataract. Could advance fairly slowly. The next two kinds, the posterior subcapsular or PSC cataract and the anterior cortical cataract, they tend to grow fairly fast, and they generally happen in more younger patients. They can happen at any age, but they're generally in more younger patient group. And the nucleus sclerosis type cataract, uh, this is fairly advanced form of it, it is more uniform. That is the whole lens of the eye becomes sort of clouded up, you know. And, but it starts in a very slow fashion. This may have taken almost 10 years to get to this stage. As versus this posterior subcapsular cataract, which is only in the back center of the capsule of the, of the lens. It's pretty tiny, but it can advance fairly fast. And it can give you symptoms of blurred vision, difficulty driving at night, difficulty in reading fairly early on, even though it's pretty small. Same thing happens with the anterior cortical type cataract. Again, it's fairly mild. You can see these little shades here, 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 and here. This is the cataract. So at this stage, the patient can see pretty fine, but as this advances more into the center here, the vision starts blurring up pretty fast. <clears throat> so, Often the question arises, can I use some medication to treat my cataract? Can I have laser surgery for the cataract? Both these statements are untrue. Unfortunately, uh, there's no medication in the form of drops or pills that you can use for the cataract. The only solution for the cataract is the surgical solution. And uh, cataract surgery, we can talk in more detail so you understand what it's all about. First of all, it's the most commonly done procedure on the human body these days. Uh, perhaps in the range of 1.2 to 2 million surgeries a year across the US. And surgery is done with an ultrasound probe. Uh, it's also called a FACO emulsifier. The word FACO means the lens or the cataract. Emulsification, of course, means to break into tiny pieces. So what you do is use this ultrasound probe that goes inside the eye through a very small incision, and that can break the cataract into small particles, and that can then aspirate the cataract through a tiny two millimeter incision. And uh, of course, when we remove the cataract, we put a intraocular lens implant in the eye. Remember, the cataract is the lens of the eye which has become clouded. So we're removing this lens from the eye whose power is typically in the range of 15 to 20 or 30 diopters. It varies from patient to patient. So we have to choose that much power of the implant that goes inside the eye. This is a graphic description of the ultrasound probe. This is, of course, a pretty magnified picture. This is the ultrasound probe, and this yellowish thing here is the cataract. The ultrasound has already eaten up almost 60, 80% of the cataract here. And so that's what we do. We basically kind of grind into this part by part and then aspirate it as we continue. Typically, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to do the surgery. And other description of the cataract. Most surgeons will use two instruments. This is the ultrasound probe, and this is the second instrument to, instrument to basically manipulate and control the cataract so it does not hit the other tissues in the eye as we do the surgery. Uh, it's an outpatient surgery, which is you can do it either in the ophthalmologist's own little center, or you can go into a multi-specialty center, or you can go into a hospital-based outpatient center. The idea is there's no reason to stay overnight in the hospital. Surgery takes about 20 to 30 minutes. 
your total stay may be two, three, four hours, depending on each center, how long they want you to be there. And you will be pretty much awake in most situations. Occasional patient might fall asleep. You want the patient to stay awake so they can communicate with you, so they can at least listen to you if there's a reason to, for you to talk to the patient. Generally, the sedation is fairly mild to moderate, about two to three milligrams of any sedating, uh, sedative agents. So you are relaxed, but you can still talk to the doctor as they do surgery. There's no pain involved. There may be some degree of uh, feeling of water flowing over the eye or minimal discomfort in most cases. Now, let's talk about IOL implants. What is exactly this IOL is? Uh, first of all, some of the common myths or concerns people have is, do I, if I have the IOL on my eye, can I have MRI or X-ray or CT scan? Yes, absolutely you can. And number two, does it matter if I have silicon implant or plastic implant or acrylic implant? Not really, they're all about the same in terms of the refracting power, in terms of the way you see through them. But what's more important is, should you have a standard implant or a premium intraocular lens implant? Now, of course, the premium implant, which could be either multifocal or toric, which corrects the astigmatism they will cost you more money out of pocket. The average cost may be as much as $1,500 to $2,000. That is not covered by insurances or Medicare. So why do you want to care about these multifocal or toric lenses? Well, if you're extremely vain, you don't want to use any glasses after cataract surgery. Uh, multifocal lens can give you fairly good vision, up close for reading, for computer, and for driving, in most cases. And toric lenses can take out your pre-existing astigmatism that you may have in your glasses before the surgery. Uh, this is how a standard lens implant looks like. This is how it looks inside the eye when the pupil is dilated. This is how the picture looks. The central part of this lens is basically the refracting surface, about six to seven millimeter in diameter. It's called the optical zone. And it has these two little tentacles on each side that sort of fixates the lens in the capsular bag behind the pupil where the original lens or the cataract used to be. Now this is a multifocal lens. It's harder to see in this picture, but this is basically multiple rings. And each ring has a different focal point. For example, you can see up here with the first ring and here with the second, here with the third. So you can pretty much have progressive vision at each distance. Not quite perfect, but fairly good for most patients. A uh, question often arises, do I need to wear glasses after cataract surgery? And lots of patients have come to believe that you do not. That is not true in most cases. If you have had glasses before surgery, the chance are you're going to need glasses after the surgery also, especially for reading. On the other hand, if you decide to go with multifocal lenses, your chance of dependence on the glasses is fairly small. But then you're talking about a cost out of pocket which is close to $1,500 to $2,000. Now, on the other hand, if you have astigmatism your whole life in your glasses and that drives you crazy because you can't see clearly, now you have an opportunity to correct that with a toric lens during the cataract surgery. Uh, what happens after the surgery? What are the things you need to do or what are the things you can do? I would say across the board, you can go back to regular stuff on the second day after surgery. On the day of the surgery, of course, you're going to be fairly sedated and a little bit tired and you need to take a rest, sleep. On the day of surgery, at the end of the day, you can possibly go out for a walk, go out for dinner. You'll have generally an eye patch on the eye. Second day, you can resume most activity unless you're working outdoors. If you're working with, there's a lot of dirt around, there's a lot of things flying around, you may not want to go to work for at least a week's time. You need to protect your eye from trauma, and the protection is pretty basic. For example, if you're used to sleeping only on one side, and that's the side we did surgery on, or if you're used to sleep on your stomach, then we may give you a little shield to put on the eye to protect you at nighttime for the first week. And uh, if you, of course, going to be working outdoors where the risk of foreign bodies flying into the eye, you may want to put the shield on also. You're going to use antibiotics and anti-inflammatory drops for the first three to four weeks. Antibiotics so you don't get any infection and anti-inflammatory 
to decrease the surgical trauma in the eye. Typically, the second eye can be operated within two to four weeks after the first eye, if you need the surgery in the second eye. What are the risks and complications in cataract surgery? Because it has one, become one of the safest surgery and one of the most commonly done surgery, the belief is it's a very minor surgery. It is not. It is a very major surgery in the sense that you got to get inside the eyeball and anything can happen, anything can go wrong. Still, statistically, the surgical complication risk is under 2%. That means most patients are going to do fine without any major concerns. Now, remember one rule of thumb, which basically is just the opposite of the way it used to be in the old days. In the old days, you used to wait until the last minute to do cataract surgery. You wanted to mature the cataract. You wanted to make sure the cataract is ripe before the surgery is done. Why? Because we had to deliver the cataract as one piece. We didn't want it to break on the way. Now we want to do much early on when it's still less hard or less ripe so we can break it into tiny particles with ultrasound and deliver it without too much trauma to the eye from the ultrasound. So the more advanced the cataract or more mature the cataract, the higher is the risk of complication today because we have used a lot more ultrasound power. Now what are the serious complications? The first two, the dropped nucleus and retained cortex, typically happens more in very advanced cataract. If the cataract becomes very advanced, the nucleus or the center of the cataract becomes extremely hard, stone-like almost. And the capsule which is wrapped around that becomes loose. So as you are trying to break the cataract and remove it, it can just go through that capsule and fall into the back of the eye. And that means you're going to end up needing a second surgery. That risk is still perhaps less than 1% or half percent. It's not a common concern. The retained cortex means that the small particles of the cataract may stay in the eye because of difficult surgery. The pupil was too small, patient was taking certain medication like uh, Flomax for prostate uh, enlargement. Patient may be feeling discomfort, so surgeon may have to hurry up the surgery. For some of the uncommon reasons, sometimes the retained cortex can be in the eye. But that you can generally treat with medication. You don't have to go back to surgery for that. Number two, excessive post-op inflammation. Again, it goes back to the point one here. The more advanced the cataract, the more inflammation is going to happen in the eye post-surgery because you're going to take longer time to do the surgery. Number three, displacement of the lens implant. Fairly uncommon again, I would say maybe one or two percent chance. That is, if the surgery was more complicated, there's a chance that the bag where the lens implant goes in, that may have been disrupted, so the lens may not be exactly in the center of the bag, and it may become dislocated. It's reasonably easy to go back to center it if that happens. Uh, complication number four, infection and hemorrhage are the most serious and the deadly. Their chance is perhaps in one in, tenth, uh, one in thousand. That is 0.001%. If infection happened to the eye, uh, it can literally kill the eye. So you have to be extremely careful about using antibiotic drops and reporting to your doctor if something goes wrong, like a lot of pain in the eye, sudden blurred vision in the eye, and a uh, lot of discomfort in the eye. Hemorrhage can happen during surgery. It probably won't happen afterwards, but during surgery it can happen. It was a lot more common in the old days when we had to open the eye big time. Uh, these days it's fairly rare complication. You may have heard the word secondary cataract uh, or clouding of the posterior capsule or the posterior membrane of the cataract. When we remove the cataract, we basically remove the front membrane of the cataract, the nucleus of the cataract, and the cortex. What we leave behind is sort of like empty bag that empty bag is a so-called posterior capsule. That's where the lens implant is uh, positioned. And that posterior capsule over the next few days to few years, in about half the patients, it can become clouded. And that's the secondary cataract. It gives you pretty similar symptoms as the primary cataract. That is, the vision gets blurred, things get fogged up, you can't see as clearly. Uh, fortunately, it's pretty easy to deal with it. All you have to do is use a YAG laser which takes two or three minutes, you can open up the membrane in the center and that won't come back again. And that will help you to see pretty much back to normal within a few hours time.
And sometime maybe this is where the, the, the misconception about laser surgery for cataract has come in, you know. Because laser surgery in cataract is only for these kind of secondary cataract, not for the primary cataract. Let's talk about diabetes. By far the leading cause of new blindness across the US, even today, in spite of all kinds of early preventive measures that we have taken for diabetes. And the reason is the patient almost never gets to a doctor in time. And the diabetes in the eye doesn't tell you until it's gone all the way. There's no pain involved, there's no different look of the eye, there's no discomfort, and the disease continues within the eye without your knowledge that something's going on. And why does it cause blindness? How does it affect the eye? Remember, diabetes across the whole body is basically a disease of uncontrolled glucose levels in the blood which can then damage the endothelium or the inner lining of smaller capillaries throughout the body, but primarily in the kidney and the eye. And because of the damage to the capillaries, they start leaking and they start bleeding. And when that happens, the retina, which is the film on the eye that makes the image, the image gets blurred. And if it happens to an extensive degree where there's a lot of bleeding, then the vision can be completely blocked. Uh, diabetes in the eye is of two different uh, descriptions. One is so-called background diabetic retinopathy, which means early stage of mild leaking and mild bleeding, or more advanced proliferative disease, when you have a lot of new blood vessels that grow in the retina that can then bleed and cause massive hemorrhage in the back of the eye. Uh, this is a picture of the retina. This is the left eye of the patient. This is the optic nerve head. And these are normal veins and arteries here. And if you see these little blotches here, these are the hemorrhages in the retina. So in the form of small dots or blots or blotches of blood, it starts coming out of the capillaries in the retina. This is the center of the retina, the so-called macula. That's where all the clearest images are based. And if this stuff starts happening in the macula, then the vision starts getting blurry. Now here you can see there's some blood spots here and here. Then you see these yellow spots here. These are the so-called leaking uh, uh, spots. These are a combination of lipoproteins and lip lipids and fats and some fluid that leaks out of the capillaries. So at this stage, because the macula is still okay, this patient has a lot of these changes in the eye. This patient still may have uh, no symptoms at all. The disease has already been happening perhaps for a few years already yet the patient feels normal, the eye looks normal from the outside. This is all inside the eye. As it advances to this stage, the leakage becomes much more extensive. And you see all these extensive exudates here, this yellow stuff all around, and this thing is full of fluid. So at this stage, this patient's vision has gone down to maybe 20, 80, 20, 100, you know. And uh, this is fairly extensive amount of background retinopathy with a lot of leakage. And this is further, further down the stage, this continues into ischemic stage. Ischemic stage is where you have all these lipid exudates here, and you have extensive bleeding spots, and this is the center of the eye, and it's encroaching upon it. And at this point in time, it's going to start causing significant decrease in circulation to the retina. And at this point, the new blood vessels start to grow. Abnormal new vessel that will grow in the eye will then leak and bleed into the eye. In this picture, if you can see on the optic nerve head, you see all the little squiggly vessels here. These are all abnormal vessels. And these are the vessels which were not there before. They just grew in response to ischemia in the eye. And they are going to break down and bleed into the back chamber of the eye, as you can see in this picture. As they bleed in front of the retina or in the vitreous chamber, they will block your vision. Your symptom will be more or less like seeing certain clouds or red black spots or stuff floating around in front of the eye in the beginning stages. As it continues, it can give you more and more bleeding and ultimately can block your vision completely or significantly. Uh, why does diabetic retinopathy happen? First of all, it doesn't have to happen. Most diabetic patients can continue very normal life without having this condition develop in the eye. So the number one reason it happens is that the blood sugars are not properly controlled. 
Any uncontrolled diabetic patient is going to develop the disease faster and much more severe. Secondly, the longer the duration of diabetes, the higher is the risk. But as I said earlier, if disease is better controlled, the risk is still much less. And uh, so poorly controlled diabetes definitely pose much higher risk to development of retinopathy in the eye. Now, the symptoms of retinopathy as the leaking happens into the center of the eye and early on will be just blurry vision, or you can see red black spots in front of the vision as it happened in early vitreous bleeding, or you will see actually a major decrease or loss of vision from massive vitreous hemorrhage and or detached retina that can happen in the late stages. The treatment of retinopathy is fairly easy and simple in the early phases. That is, there's a leaking and some bleeding spot. You can use a laser light to seal them and stop the leaking. As the leaking stops, the vision comes back and further leaking can be controlled by laser. On the other hand, if the disease has gone into so-called proliferative phase, then you have to use much more extensive laser in the form of a pan-retinal laser photocoagulation which will cause more discomfort. It takes multiple sessions and you generally have to numb the eye with a peribulbar injection around the eye to do this procedure. And lastly, within the last five years, we have these uh, two new agents, Avestin and Lucentis. These are both so-called anti-wedge factor medications. They decrease the growth of new blood vessels in the retina. So we can inject this medication into the back chambers of the eye once a month for two, three injections, and generally can control the bleeding vessels and then add the laser if still necessary at that point. In more advanced cases where the bleeding has happened in a massive form in the back of the eye and there's a detachment of the retina, there you have to do vitrectomy surgery. That is to remove the blood and the fluid from the back of the eye surgically, uh, which is a pretty major surgery. We'll go over that in a second. Argon laser photocoagulation basically is a machine of this sort. The laser light is bluish or greenish, and the light is focused onto the eye with a contact lens. It's a large contact lens that the doctor uses, and uh, it is done under topical or numbing drops only, no injection necessary. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes, and you can go home pretty much uh, right after. And in uh, pan laser photocoagulation, this, is a, this patient has undergone pan laser. These are all multiple laser burns, these white spots. Uh, in this kind of laser, we take multiple sessions, typically two or three sessions. We generally numb the eye, and it's comparatively more uncomfortable procedure to go through. The injection that we go, give in the eye, uh, this looks pretty awful, but it's not that, that painful. Uh, injection goes into the eye. Uh, through a very tiny 30 gauge needle. And this is done generally at least uh, two or three times once a month to stop the bleeding vessel in the eye. And the most commonly used medication are these Avestin and Lucentis. And lastly, vitrectomy surgery. Uh, this surgery is only for patients who have very advanced disease, who have lost vision, or who have gone, uh, whose vision has gone down significantly. Uh, that is when the vitreous has become full of blood or the retina has scar tissue or the retina has detached. So you have to go in with vitrectomy instruments uh, and remove all the blood and the gel from the back of the eye. This surgery takes typically an hour and a half to two and a half hours. It's also done outpatient. And that is the end of the talk, I believe. Thank you so much. <laughs>